Hi, I'm Dave Garrow Jr. here to talk about the Lumiferous Ether. This is a theory my friend Bill and I worked out uh, after visiting a place called the Mystery Spot in Northern California. It's a real live gravity vortex. Has anybody but Cameron been there in this room? Oh, yeah, right, Dave. Um, it is a real live gravity vortex. I didn't think it could possibly exist when my friend told me about it. He took me there and I saw stuff like balls rolling uphill, the distortion of time space. Uh, you stand on one end of a plank and uh, your friend stands on the other, you're eye to eye, you change places, and suddenly you're looking over his head. The thing that clued me in as to the beginning of this theory was the fact that the Coriolis effect is reversed there. Water goes down the drain in the other direction. And that clued me into the fact that this anti-gravity force coming out of the ground must also have torque associated with it, as well as push. And according to Einstein, what really blew me away is, according to Einstein, this place cannot exist. You cannot have anti-gravity or anti-time. But yet, I've been there many times, and they invite you to bring your own instruments, and I've seen this place um, proven to be real, because they invite you to prove it's unreal, and nobody can. It's been there for many years. There's also one up in Oregon I recently visited. There's uh, one in South Dakota, and also one in Africa. So as the years passed, I slowly backward engineered the universe. We used the Dr. Spock School of Logic. That which is left, after all the other possibilities have been exhausted, must be true, no matter how fantastic that is. And we came up with this theory of the fact that the universe is now imploding. There was a Big Bang about twice as long ago as the universe uh, we think is old, about 35 billion years ago. The universe did blow up. It was full of hot ether and nothing else. Matter did not form until the universe reached its maximum size and began its implosion. As it imploded, for some reason, it began its implosion in a left-handed <coughs> counterclockwise spiral. Uh, many of them, as a matter of fact, about 20, a dodecahedron of imploding vortex spirals of ether occurred. And this led to the um, verification of the constant creation theory, which says hydrogen precipitates out of this implosive no, ether. No, no, no. no. Eddies happen, and hydrogen atoms come into existence out of this ether. It's like snowflakes happening in a snowstorm. They uh, precipitate out. And as the universe condensed, um, heavier and heavier elements began to form, and slowly life itself began to form. The interesting thing is, um, this explains why the Michelson-Mori theory did not work. I've heard a lot about entrainment of the ether onto objects here. And indeed, every object has its own envelope of imploding ether around it. It's not obvious, but um, I have 20 envelopes of imploding left-handed ether around me, supporting the rotation of the electrons in their orbit and uh, causing gravity itself. Gravity is an effect, not a force. You're being pushed down to the Earth right now, not pulled. Um, Michelson and Morley assumed that the ether was uh, relative to the sun or relative to the center of the universe, when indeed the ether creates matter and supports matter. Electrons would not go around in their orbit if it wasn't for the entrainment of ether around all things. Uh, Newton said it best when he said that an object in orbit is actually under constant acceleration. Therefore, every atom in your body is under constant acceleration due to the implosion of the ether. You wonder, where does the ether go? I'll get to that. The ether is a de-astrofractating function. There is such a word. You can look it up in Webster's Dictionary. Meaning that there are, say, 20 spirals of imploding ether around the Earth. But as they close in, closer and closer to matter, they break up into smaller spirals, and then smaller and smaller spirals, and then even smaller spirals. This brings to fact the um, fractal nature of reality. Uh, everything has its own conglomerate of spiraling ether imploding into it. Uh, a house, a person, a dog, the molecules in your finger, the atoms in those molecules, every individual particle. And this ether implodes all the way down. It gets thicker, too, as it gets closer to the matter it's imploding into. It gets thicker and denser, and it's able to support more weird physical uh, attributes. This is the golden mean spiral that permeates nature all over the place. Why does this spiral permeate nature? Because it is the rate of the implosion. And uh, this is the golden mean spiral. I'm pretty sure you're all familiar with it. Uh, 1618 is phi. And going the other way, 0.618 is phi. Interesting that this uh, association is called phi loss of phi. Uh, there are four spirals in nature. The initial is left-handed in. It spirals all the way down to the atomic level. 
pushes the nucleus out of this universe. Yes, this is a multi-universe uh, theory. And um, then when the nucleus comes back into this universe, it radiates a right-handed out spiral here of energy. Uh, this bounces around our universe until it inflects and turns into a right-handed in spiral. And then we have a left-handed out spiral, finally, uh, radiating out from the nucleus. So we have these four different spirals in this room right now, and we actually have three sets of each of these going at different velocities. So you have 12 uh, spirals all together. This is a uh, video of a magnet uh, in water, and it shows the vortex on the north pole of the magnet. We really don't have time to watch it, I'm afraid. Um, the reason there is a difference between uh, left-handed energy and right-handed energy. Right-handed energy is later on, it's radiated out from the nucleus of all atoms. The initial left-handed in wave is that wave, which I heard yesterday, is proposed to support gravity. It's very loose and very open and slow and uh, not very strong. It pushes down all the way to the nucleus, and then the nucleus is radiating out uh, right-handed out energy. Right-handed energy is the energy of life. It tends to organize stuff, congeal stuff, crystallize things, cool them down, keep them together, organize stuff. Whereas left-handed energy is very loose and sloppy and is responsible for things like entropy, heat, chaos, uh, things melting down, uh, things falling apart, stuff like that. This is the nucleus. Uh, this is actually a um, computer simulation we did that shows when you add 12 spins to a particle, this is how the particle behaves. It shrinks down, it's forced, uh, any point of the particle can be seen to move faster and faster as it rotates. As this point reaches the speed of light, the particle has to shrink to uh, prevent a paradox, and eventually it disappears right out of this continuum. It comes back and it increases in size, radiating out right-handed energy, and repeats the cycle. This cycle happens about 600 million times per second in each atom. It's too fast to see because we're all oscillating too. But uh, that's actually what's going on on the nuclear level. There are three adjacent universes to ours. We're the left-handed in universe, the universe that goes to the right-handed out universe, the right-handed in universe, then the left-handed out universe, and then comes back to ours. These universes come in tetrahedral sets, and we don't know how many there are, but uh, we're only going to discuss three of them. Things like quantum uh, computing actually verify the fact there are parallel universes. And uh, we're starting to not only find this out hypothetically, but we're using these universes in uh, computers and stuff. Inertia is simply the fact that um, the implosion gets unbalanced when you start to accelerate something. And a low pressure system occurs on the uh, backside of the particle. So that offers drag to the particle. So Really, inertial is just a theoretical drag on things. This I'm going to skip. It's an inertial drive. This is a way to uh, overcome gravity and uh, turn rotational momentum into linear uh, acceleration. But we'll have to skip that. Not enough time here. Um, this also says inducing a figure eight pattern in the atomic structure of things can uh, cause anti-gravity. Here's an interesting thing we stumbled across during our research. Uh, it takes about 90 minutes for a uh, vessel to circulate, uh, you know, orbit the Earth. And um, if you have a rocket that uh, is standing still, overcoming gravity over Cape Canaveral, say, um, and you have one in orbit at the same altitude, it takes exactly the same amount of time for an object to go into orbit around the Earth once as the rocket would take to accelerate to the speed of light if it wasn't for our gravity of Earth. So every time the rocket goes from zero to the speed of light, the satellite completes one orbit. This ties together time, space, and uh, the speed of gravity. Uh, the universe is a toroid. We figured that much out. Um, and by figuring this out, you're able to use the principle of constant acceleration to capture some of these etherical waves. It's not easy, but I've come up with something called a tensor coil. And um, this is based on the theory of constant acceleration. The um, electrons in this coil go around in figure eight. First they go right, then they go left, so you're accelerating them again. Then they go down into a smaller coil. So you're using constant acceleration all the time. There's three levels of this. And um, there's also tessellation in the coil. So this coil is designed to resonate with constant acceleration of the ether waves themselves, the imploding waves and the exploding waves. This coil is designed to catch all 12 waves. 
and make the electrons traveling in this particular path surf these waves, thereby gaining more energy and more spin. So it turns some of these waves into energy, and uh, pretty soon these coils start resonating and emitting uh, EMF. If you take this coil and dangle it, which you're all welcome to try after this lecture, you can actually, some people call it the invisible dog leech, you can actually feel the tensor fields around certain things, especially it's made out of non-ferrous material, and you can feel the coil resonate with the ether envelopes around things like wood, which have a lot of right-handed energy. Um, and if you walk it across the floor, it'll jerk one way and the other. It senses what's underneath the floor, even though it's made out of a non-ferrous material. And uh, this is another video I don't have time for. Uh, here's the 3D tensor coil I was talking about. Three of the figure eights are bent down, designed to catch the incoming waves and accelerate inward and downward. And then the next three are 90 degrees out of phase and catch the outgoing waves as they go out. And then it's either repeated or the um, electron leaves this time space after it's uh, accelerated beyond the speed of light rotationally. You don't have to accelerate something in a linear fashion to get it going faster than light. You can spin it faster than light. Now this coil that was found by a fellow scientist that I met um, who suggested I try this experiment actually tends to focus the ether energy and make uh, lentils sprout quicker than the control group over here. This is a, a quick um, demonstration of that. You can see the lentils next to the coil are more numerous and uh, more advanced and sprouted beefier than the control group here. I think this implies that uh, this technology has agricultural and potential commercial uses. Uh, again, you can see the final result. The uh, ether coil lentils sprouted much quicker and beefier, and they tasted better. Um, this is a superluminal accelerator using the same principle of accelerating something in all three axes at once. You accelerate them on the y-axis, on the x-axis, right, left, up, and down. And by doing so, eventually, you'll add enough spin to um, whatever pore matters underneath this coil. Uh, this would be done by firing magnets in this pattern here to accelerate the electrons, or actually to accelerate the um, atoms in your subject down here, which would be this. This might be your spaceship, say. You accelerate the atoms in this pattern, and the atoms become so agitated and spin so fast, your object will leave this continuum and go elsewhere. We're not sure how to navigate, actually. Uh, this is another thing here to um, actually resonate with the implosion. If you've ever noticed when you're taking a spiral, sometimes there's spikes in the water. Uh, and you can splash the spikes, and they come back in the same place. These are standing waves in the spiral. And I've always wondered about them. This is a, a mathematical uh, way of determining where these spirals occur. And what you do is um, you resonate with these spirals. And it comes up with a pattern here. If you were to take, say, a piece of metal or a mirror, I've done this many times, and sand it in this particular um, pattern, three times right 72 degrees, one time left 72 degrees, one time right 72 degrees, five times left, etc., they start resonating with a particular wave. The first uh, sequence here would be right in, and then right out, and this would be left in and left out, this pattern here. And when you sand the surface in this pattern or you make a magnetic winding in this pattern, it starts resonating with the uh, ether waves. And uh, they do things like increase the local light. Uh, they attract light more. Um, they conduct electricity better. And again, they uh, attract the ether energy and uh, grow plants better too. I really don't have time to go into the math behind this uh, right now. We've talked a lot about dark matter here at the conference. Uh, I don't believe in dark matter. I believe it's an etherical effect, which is caused when two photons cross each other's path in the uh, galaxy. Uh, dark matter has been found around galaxies, around the edge in particular, and this is the place of the most luminosity interfering with itself. The photons from the left-handed uh, side of the galaxy cross over the photons being emitted by the right-handed uh, side of the galaxy, and as they cross paths, they interfere gravitationally. Now, Newton says something changing direction is under constant acceleration, but the photons are already going light speed, so they cannot accelerate anymore. What happens is space-time itself is pulled apart just a little bit when these photons pass each other's path, and when they recede from each other, uh, space-time snaps together and a slight little gravity wave is emitted. 
So what is now considered to be the majority of matter in the universe is only a, a gravitational effect caused by the interference of photons. And uh, so there is no such thing as dark matter. Uh, dark energy is another big subject these days. The last gentleman just said dark energy has been proved. Well, I doubt it. The fact that the universe is shrinking causes us to think that the universe is expanding ever faster, ever faster, because it is shrinking ever faster, ever faster, using the potential energy that was um, expanded, you know, was used up when the universe expanded. The universe is now contracting, but not at a uniform rate. It's contracting faster and faster and faster. So to any person or any point in this universe, the rest of the universe appears to be moving away from them, to be expanding ever faster, ever faster. So if you and I shrunk down to half of our original size right now, even if we got a little closer to each other, we would look further apart. And this is what dark energy is. It's actually the energy of the implosion happening, which uh, was the kinetic energy that happened when it blew up and turned into potential energy. And it is now returning in the form of kinetic energy. So there is no such thing as dark energy either. It's another theoretical effect of the implosion of the universe. And uh, this is just to say that um, space starts incoming um, between two places. Like say there's an envelope between me and this docket here. The space piles in and half of it goes towards the docket, half of it goes towards me. The cashmere effect is uh, something that happens when you get two plates of metal close enough so that the ether on one side doesn't have enough time or space to get to the atoms of that piece of metal. Then only the ether on the outside is pushing on it and suddenly the plates are slammed together. This is um, what might be called free energy. I mean, where's the energy coming from to slam these two plates together and keep them together? This, indeed, the cashmere effect might be used to generate electricity in the future. But it is caused by the implosion of ether. Um, let's see here. Uh, this is just to say that, well, we'll skip this. Um, also, we came across something called the T-axis, which is what we think is a measurement of the fourth dimension. If you spin something like that weight that the guy spun over his head, it actually is in a different place in time because it's moving relativistically. And I, I'll say the relativistic effects are caused by the ether. Uh, Einstein isn't all wrong. Some of the effects he noticed uh, really do happen. And the t-axis is the distance between you and the object uh, time-wise. How long does it take a photon for you, uh, a photon to go from you to the object or from the object to you? The object doesn't have to move in relation to the x, y, or z axis, but if it shrinks, it's further away from you, although it's still in the same place. If its gravitational field increases due to spin, it is shrinking in terms of time space. So it's still in the same place as far as the y, x, and z axis goes, but it's in a different temporal perspective um, than it was before, and it's actually further away from you. So this t axis should be um, considered when uh, physics does its thing. Um, pi is not a constant you've been lied to all your life. They say constants um, are unchanging. I don't believe anything in the universe is actually constant. I think everything is in flux. I think the Buddhists were right. All is change. Uh, we don't believe in infinity. We don't believe in absolute zero when it comes to the measurement of real quantities. If you're measuring space, time, energy, mass, length, uh, anything real, um, there's going to be a certain amount of stuff there that you can't observe. It doesn't mean it's zero. So the last zero in a number is strictly a probability envelope. It's us looking at the object or measuring it and saying, well, it's about there. Okay, we'll call that zero. No, there's actually something down there. It might be a negative quantity. It might be a, qu a positive quantity. But there's something there that we can't see that we're calling absolute nothing. And that's wrong. Uh, there is a, um, a average estimate of what we can't see. There is a value for zero. But before I get to that, let's finish up with pi here. Pi changes according to the gravitational field that you're in. The higher density the gravitational field you're in, the greater the relationship between the radius and the circumference. If you're in space that has very little gravity, 
okay, it's almost pi. But as you get into a higher density field, uh, pi is going to increase because the radius bends in one uh, dimension on the x-axis, say, but the circumference is bent on two axes, x and y. So the ratio between the circumference and radius and the diameter of your circle is going to be in flux constantly. So pi is a nice average, but when you're dealing with very intense gravitational fields or on the nuclear level where uh, gravitational fields are, uh, or magnetic or electrostatic fields are very intense, pi is going to be in flux and it's never going to be the same. Uh, here's the average value of zero. It is a probability envelope. And uh, if, there, if the zero is in the middle of the number here, okay, that's a real zero. There are no 100s there. And if the zero is here, that's saying, okay, there are no tenths there. But this zero here is just saying, well, we can't see anything further down there. And on the average, this is going to be the amount of stuff that is not visible, is not measurable there. It's going to be another five zero 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 one four seven on the average. And if you include this in your scientific calculations when measuring stuff, uh, you'll find, say you do a thousand measurements, this quantity really adds up. So you'll wind up with stuff that um, you didn't think was there unless you include the zero um, approximation. Uh, the universe does resonate in seven. We don't know why. It tends to, that tends to be the flow of the ether, we think. It takes four steps forward, and then it slows down three steps. And then it takes four steps forward, and then it slows down three steps. It backs up, maybe. Uh, we think this is responsible for the quantization of gravity and uh, other quantum effects due to the acceleration and deceleration of the um, ether itself. That's what I was trying to get at with the uh, spirals and those patterns I talked about that you can uh, sand stuff in or want make magnetic windings in that resonate with the ether. It has to do with the increasing speed of the ether, then it slows down and bunches up into a hill, and then it races forward again until, again, it slows down later on and bunches up some more. And um, it's actually somewhat predictable. And if we can predict these slowing downs and speedings up, we can harvest the ether energy and turn it into EMF or turn it into gravity. I've seen gravitational effects in my experiments or turn it into uh, the life force itself and uh, sprout uh, lentils more often. Um, this is just a, a fun little thing to say that um, when you look at an object, there's quantum tunneling occurring at the back of your eye. And the quantum tunneling soaks up more ether than most average processes do. So when you're staring at something, you're staring at it and giving it at tension. What you're doing is creating a low pressure system on that side of the object that you're staring at. And the object is actually drawn towards you. They've done studies where they find that uh, people um, can sense when people are staring at them. And I think this is another quantum effect due to the ether. Um, quantum entanglement. Um, we think that <clears throat> the ether is such that if you take a photon beam and split it, that the two photons are standing still in time because time actually is a product of ether flow. If the ether was not flowing, time would not happen. Electrons would not orbit, nothing would move be no place to move to. So when entanglement happens, it's really the photons are standing still in relationship to time, and the ether is flooding in between them. So the photons really never part. You move one, the other moves, because they're right next to each other. It's kind of a weird concept, but uh, that's how busy we are shrinking and imploding all the time. It is at the speed of light. Uh, these ether waves move at the speed of light. And, uh, wow, I sure rushed through that one quick. That is basically implosive vortex dynamics. Any questions? We've got a couple minutes, so. Not a single question? Yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, Mr. Lu uh, Dr. Lucas at the back, please. <laughs> I was going to tell you about a phenomenon I saw with my family on vacation in Canada. We were going along, camping along the uh, St. Lawrence Seaway when we got out to the Atlantic, either on Prince Edward Island or just before you got on the island, there was a waterfall where the water went up. Wow. I've never seen that anywhere before. It only goes up when the tide's a certain level, but then it goes up. 
mm -hmm. and, you know, above the tide coming in. And uh, the other thing that was there was there was a hill. You would drive your car up to about the middle of the hill, turn your motor off, leave it in neutral, and it would go up the rest of the way to the hill without a motor on. Mm. That's just like the mystery spot in Santa Cruz. Yeah, and so uh, they uh, they didn't know what what it did, but they they were it was a tourist attraction, so they, yeah. they would get you to come. And uh, so that might be interesting to to follow up. You might be able to get a video of that waterfall going up uphill. Mm. Uh, that I suspect there's a video somewhere. Yeah, that. I'd like to see that. They have a. You can check out the uh, mystery spot on YouTube. They have a yeah. Lot of videos of the effects. You know, yeah. the mystery spot stuff. Let me write down your email and I'll try to find it. And send it to me. Okay, you. great. Because I'd love to see it. I just saw the one in Oregon, and uh, it's even better than the one in Santa Cruz because their demonstrations are a little better. Uh -huh. And if anybody would like to come up and uh, dangle this over the floor, you're welcome. Uh -huh. It uh, catches ether waves. I know it's kind of an odd thing. It's made out of non-ferrous material, yet when you hold it near stuff, you can feel it repelled or uh, attracted to it. Your question? If these anomaly places will cause something to go uphill, shouldn't they, if you're in the middle of them, raise you, cause you to go up? Well, yes, at the middle of the well, mystery spot, they, when the tour guide, you know, walks you up the hill and whatnot, no, 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 you're no, leaning no. so I mean, far forward. I mean raise you. Uh, the force isn't that strong. There's actually a weight that hangs down from the roof of the little shack in the middle of the spot, and it hangs down at this angle. You're such that uh, you're leaning into this anti-gravity force so heavily that if you look down, you can't see your own feet. And this thing that hangs from the um, little shack in the middle is a big, heavy steel weight. You get on one side of it, and you can barely push it, and you get on the other side of it, and it's easy to push with one finger. So there's definitely something happening there. And uh, I think it's just um, um, a large concentration of energy coming of these waves that I talked about coming out of the ground. There's something emitting waves down there. They don't know what it is. There seems to be a car-sized object about 300 feet underground beneath the water table. They don't but uh, it's a conic um, force coming out of the ground, and they say that helicopters can even feel them flying over it. And instruments do not work in that spot. Uh, electric, uh, you know, gizmos do not work. Uh, I took a, a digital camera into the spot, and everything had trails behind it. You go like this, and you can see images of ghost images of your hand behind it. And then once you left the spot, the digital camera worked again. So that was a very strange effect. And they invite you to bring your own instruments. The guy has a government level, and he puts the level down this way, and he turns it around and puts it down that way. And he says, bring your own level. And he takes the level off, and then he puts a golf ball here. here and the golf ball not only rolls uphill, but it accelerates uphill. So uh, that verifies that these waves keep everything, not only in this room, but the entire universe, under constant acceleration. And that's where the energy that powers gravity and all the various like Dr. Lucas says, um, all the forces of nature are driven by the universal force. And this universal force is the ever accelerating implosion of this ether. That's why the kilogram I heard yesterday is uh, gaining in mass. And I've also read that uh, atomic reactions are changing um, their speed. They're happening uh, more quickly now than they did back in the 50s when we started measuring them. So the only explanation for that is an increase in the thickness of the ether. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that we're going through the galactic plane right now. And the ether gets thicker when it gets around a lot of matter. So we're, the galactic plane is thicker ether than any other part of the galaxy. And Earth and our solar system are going through this plane right now. And consequently, things are getting heavier, atomic reactions are happening at a quicker rate, etc. Okay. Uh, could you please uh, provide some information, maybe some more detailed uh, explanation of yeah, the I, resonance, uh, resonance part. The okay. reason, the resonance uh, with those numbers that you were showing here. Uh, yeah, I'd be delighted to. Those numbers and, you know, what actually does that mean uh, when you be, uh, talking about it, entering the reson resonance with uh, Okay, well, uh, quickly, if I have enough time, five minutes? Uh, yes, you do. Okay. Um, we determine those resonant patterns by taking a wheel, a five-sided wheel, and accelerating it ever faster according to a phi acceleration. So the first 
Second, it, it uh, accelerates 0 0.618 times 72 degrees. The second second, it accelerates 72 degrees. The third second, it accelerates 1.618 times 72 degrees. Every time the wheel goes around once, 360 degrees, it flips over and you see the black side of the wheel. So it takes three seconds for it to go around once and it's going faster, it flips over, then it takes one second for it to go around again before it flips over and then it takes one second again before it flips over. And that's how the pattern is generated. The wheel keeps accelerating faster and faster, but no matter how many times it flips over, you look at it at the beginning of each second, and that's your observation. And um, if the wheel is black for the first beginning of the first five seconds after that, you put black down, and then white after that. If you'd like to see my entire presentation in a more calm and collected manner, it is on YouTube under Implosive Vortex Dynamics or my name, Dave Garraway Jr. I did it when I had a little more time to go into uh, detail about <coughs> the various aspects of the resonance and waves and whatnot. Yes? Yeah, they had to um, map the Earth with the sand because there's strange uh, gravitational anomalies all over the Earth. And these satellites, when they put them in orbit, the satellites are not going in a, in a, in a, they're going on a line, a curve, but they're wiggling. Because really? The Earth has some gravitational uh, anomalies in certain places. Wow, well, I've only heard of helicopters being affected by the And then they know the moon is strange because one face of the moon is always facing the Earth because there's a gravitational, um, uh, you know, lock. The moon is locked and it's actually wiggling like this. You know? mm -hmm. And because what's happening is that one face is always facing us. We didn't, we didn't know what the back side of the moon looked like until recently, until about, what was it, 50 years ago? Mm -hmm. We put satellites around. Interesting. Yeah, the tour guide at the mystery spot told me there's one spot in Africa that's so strong that nobody that goes in it ever comes out. Wow. <laughs> and there's one there's one place in uh, Thailand, I believe, that's a, a Buddhist monastery. And the Buddhists go out every morning and try to push this boulder over a cliff. And the boulder comes back. Wow. And the, the, um, their belief is that when they're finally able to push that boulder over the cliff, that's the end of time. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> So, what, what's this strange stuff? You say, you're saying that, that a kilogram is changing values and all this stuff? Well, that's what I was told yesterday. What, Dave told me that. What are the guys that did the gold dealers? You know, they, they, How are you going to trust anybody that you've got the right gold? <laughs> right? Yeah, hold on to your gold and we'll just get heavier and worth more, huh? <laughs> it doesn't help because they all get bigger. <laughs> Together. Yeah, I figure if atomic rates are uh, decaying, that uh, you know, atomic bombs may not work someday or something like that. Right, that's Maybe right. reactors will go into meltdown spontaneously or something. But that's the that's the given. Then. If you can if you can neutralize the atomic bombs, then we won't have a war. Yeah, that'd be nice, huh? <laughs> yeah, I think that could be done with the proper wave of conglomeration. You know? I think these uh, the twelve waves can be combined in different combinations to uh, yeah. produce different effects, and I think um, uh, they can be used for healing too. I think these these coils like this one here can actually. Uh, promote healing because they concentrate the right-handed energy <laughs> and all life is based on right-handed energy all DNA on this planet is a right-handed spiral and that's not uh, a coincidence because um, as, as he asked about the resonance um, a right-handed spiral has 360 degrees in it but a left-handed spiral has 396 because it's a little looser it takes longer to make a left-handed circle than it does a right-handed circle there's more information that you can put in a right-handed spiral than a left-handed spiral. That's why DNA is right-handed, because it keeps the you know the energy of right-handedness keeps things together. The Bible itself says we're born into sin. Sinister wow. means to move left. Sin it means left-handed movement, and orgo or organic means right-handed movement. And you know again in the Bible everything that is righteous and good is right-handed, right? That's because right-handed energy is good and, and good for life. It keeps stuff together and organized how, and flowing. And, uh, you know. how, how to determine the right-hand spiral or left-hand spiral? Uh, clockwise or counterclockwise relative to the direction of local gravity. Go, going down? Yeah, oh, okay. going down relative to the direction. There's nowhere in this universe that doesn't have gravity. There's gravity all over the place. And that's one constant in the universe you can count on. There's going to be a vector direction of Ether flow, no matter where you go. Does nope. that mean it's bad to live below the equator? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, uh, stuff happens a little slower, more chaotic down there. Okay, folks. What's going on in the Bermuda Triangle, man? 
Okay, well let's let's wrap it up because we're at five o'clock. So, all right, thank you so much. Okay, they are setting.